Is that better? All right, so let's start. I'm Chang. I have about two years of data science experience. I, used to, um, I work in retail. I used to work in sports, and before that, I work in academia. So what I'm going to say today, just like what the title says, is a only one step ahead guide. I'm by no means I'm saying this is a comprehensive guide. I don't intend it to be a comprehensive guide. And I want this to be a discussion afterwards. Even after this conference, feel free to, to tweet me, send me an email. We can all have discussion. If you find a, you have a better idea, let's, let's discuss. Because this is not the best practice. Nobody knows what the best practice is. But I would like to present my view, or better put, why I suck. <laughs> so the story usually goes like this. You have a manager or you have a friend who says, hey, I got a lot of data, and I have this business problem I want to solve. So your friend come to you and say, hey, we have a problem. What can we do? We have a lot of data. We th I think we should be able to do X, Y, Z. So you're like, OK, uh, this is 21st century, so the natural response is let me Google my solution. So you go on Google, you put in data, solve, problem, X, Y, Z, and out comes the machine learning unicorn. <laughs> because it does solve everything. Is that true? Well, I'm not saying it's not true. It does solve tons of problems. And when used right, it's incredible. My experience has been that you know, you have some data, you collect your data, you lay out, OK, this is my project plan. We should can do this. We can achieve x, y, z. This will be great. Everything will be awesome. But what it really feels like was an impossible journey. It feels like I'm taking this ring to the volcano of Mordor. <laughs> Why is it so hard? What's wrong? Where is that fantasy land that all the tutorials, all the blog posts, all the online courses everybody told me about. Where is that great promised land that people say, hey, machine learning solves everything? Why is it so hard to make it work in real world? Or why is it so hard to achieve what I want it to be without wasting so much time? So after a few projects, it got me thinking, what are some common things that made me less efficient than I would like to? What are some things that they don't teach you in the tutorials? What are some things that I would tell myself, if I, if I were to start again to tell myself from two years ago, because I only have two years of experience, what I would tell myself? And I, my goal in this talk is to help you by hopefully in the next 15 minutes, that will save you 15 hours or, or more. And so let's start. Before we want to do a machine learning project, let's talk about what machine learning is. In, one, in a one sentence summary, I would say machine learning is you want to make prediction with data. Making prediction with data. So you have a, a set of data. You have to think about like a huge pile of whatever. You just try to put things around and then say, oh, this pile of data should give me this outcome. This pile of data should give me that, that outcome. So you have some data based on some weird mathematical rule or algorithm or very complex stuff. Maybe we can predict the outcome of something. So machine learning is about prediction. This is how human makes prediction, or at least how I make prediction. If I come, come in today, I'm like, oh, um, Yes or no, right? We've all, we've all seen flow charts. You know, if I see, if I read, uh, look at the weather channel, it says it's going to rain today. I'm going to prepare it. So I would go, okay. If it rains, I'm going to do X. If it didn't rain, I'm going to do Y. Humans are great at the, making these kind of predictions or rule-based 
outcome, you want to um, take your action based on some rules. And simple rules are great. You know, if you have six boxes on the slide, I can usually understand what you're trying to say. What happens in the business is, <laughs> I always, yeah, I always walk into those business slash IT meetings with like 40, uh, I don't even know how they call it, but they're like, okay, we have this thing, we're gonna implement it, we're gonna do something to it, or wanna add another rule to it. It's too complex for me to understand. Every time I sit in there, I'm like, I just, just, just let me, go, let me go, please. Don't, don't put it. Don't put me in a recurring meeting with you. <laughs> um, it's not their fault, right? Because sometimes we need to build software, and we need to deliver results. And the software has to abide by the business logic, and business logic is, could grow like that. So. We are really bad at handling complex rules, but we still want to make prediction, and that's where machine learning comes in. Any, anywhere that you think or you see a rule-based system, that might be an opportunity for machine learning, or things that you think that we, you could have built a rule-based system, but doesn't seem to have any proper tool that you cannot do anything about it, maybe machine learning is a solution. That's one thing that you can use machine learning on. An example would be financial crime. Back in the day, I guess I'm thinking about like, I don't know, Westworld or something. <laughs> you know, back in the day, if you have someone robbed the bank, you just have a deputy or someone with a cowboy hat and then just like chase that bad guy, you know, with that bag of money. But we live in 21st century. Financial crime are bad and they are plenty and they're diverse. There's just way too many possibilities and way too many cases. It's an organizational crime. Happens everywhere, data breaches everywhere. How do you even catch those bad people? Well, you make a robot catch it. <laughs> That's why all the banks are using machine learning to predict your fraud or any fraud cases because it's way too there are way too many cases for human to handle, and way too, the rules are way too, com compli way too complex for human to make sense of, out of the data. That's a great use case of machine learning. So the question is, if your friend comes to you and say, hey, we have a business problem we want to solve, the first ask, question you ask back is, what does it do? What do you want the product to do? Is our goal to build something that make prediction, to make individual prediction of each event? Each thing should have its own outcome. If yes, machine learning might be a solution. If not, maybe what we want is statistics. Maybe you want to aggregate the data and collect some sort of average, variance, things like that. Or maybe they just want some reports to understand their data. Or maybe we can run some experiments to understand the business world. Those are use cases that machine learning are not suitable because the co more complex your model is, so I didn't define what a model is. Think of model as something that is, uh, I'm gonna use that example like a blender. You throw in a bunch of ingredients and it gives you a smooth smoothie. So there's a, a lot of things happening in that blender. I don't care, right? But um, the more complex your model is, the harder to extract insights from your model, and most likely you want to rely on those tools instead of using machine learning. So number one, ask what you really want. What do you want to solve? What, what kind of problem do you want to solve before you start machine learning? Also ask where the data is. This sounds like a simple thing, but it's not because there will be, there's bound to be some people that has some Excel spreadsheet in their laptop that never disclosed to anybody and is absolutely helpful to your project. Uh, just a few days ago, I discovered a table that I didn't know exist, it existed six months ago. I spent like two weeks trying to find it and I never found it. And then like this person on our team just like, hey, 
go ahead. Like, this is this is what you want. I was like, where did you find it? I have no idea. Like, so <laughs> I'll go deeper on this. Find your data before you start your machine learning project. Find the, maybe not all the data, but 80% of what's relevant you think might be relevant to your problem. Go interview people around that data lake because there are a lot of tribes around that data lake. Go talk to them. Ask the domain experts what they think of it. And they might tell you some useful resource. So that's one thing I learned is like, you know, just conversational or learn to talk to people is very, very valuable just to find where your data is. Because the, the more data you have, when you actually start your project, the better is your pipeline. What I meant by a pipeline is once now we, we decided we want to uh, do a machine, we want to start our machine learning project, always make sure you have a solid, robust data pipeline. A pipeline that will not break when you go into production. Or at least a small scale of what should be in production. Because during the learning phase of your project, when you're building a model, when you're trying to make prediction, oh, you will see that usually the first iteration will be, you will get horrible results. And to get to where it become profitable for uh, your job or at least acceptable, acceptable, acceptable to your own self, it's going to take many, many, many iterations. And the better your data pipeline is, the faster you can iterate. And I think one of, one of the things that I learned was why software developers are so valuable in data science or machine learning projects is, is because they understand how to make a great data pipeline. They can make it run real fast. If you have computer science skill or not, whatever, you know how to make sure, you know, build a fail-safe pipeline. I don't know. I don't know how to do that. So a lot of time I have to uh, learn from, either learn from others or try to put together my own pipeline. And it just, I took a lot of time and just, you couldn't iterate as fast as I would want to. And make sure you have a good pipeline that gets the data in a way that you want it. Ideally, press a button or even schedule a job that the data always come in, new data always come in, because we will, you will not be working on just a single CSV file. You will be working, if there's new data come in every day, most of the time we want to predict into the future. So you want to make sure that pipeline of the future data is always feeding into your current system. So you, you can, you know, if you have new learnings, you can just go ahead and fetch that data. After this, I'm going to address two questions that I think uh, bothers me the most about when you, what happens when you start a machine learning project is, one, what kind of metric should I optimize? Machine learning, because it's making a prediction, eventually you have to evaluate your model. If I have iteration one, iteration two, how can I say iteration two is better than iteration one? So you have to make a metric and you have to track it, how do I pick that metric? Two, and I think this is the most important question or most common question is, what kind of model should I use when I first started? And that is definitely my own question when I first started two years ago. I still don't have a definite answer to it, but I think I have some idea. So, defining metric. If you have a business problem, there's usually a few metrics that a business user like to track. Uh, think of it as, let's say, if I'm running a restaurant. One thing I would definitely love to track is revenue and maybe customer satisfaction. Define what kind of metric you want to optimize on and try to translate whatever machine learning metric that, you know, like if you're making a classification there's usually people will talk about accuracy and whatever. If you can convert it back to some terms that everybody can uh, understand, don't use like all the too complicated metrics, just find something that everybody can understand, stick to it. Let's say revenue. And now, if you say revenue, people will start throwing other questions to you. 
if you're running a restaurant, should we count tips as revenue? Uh, if we're um, having some uh, discounts or something, should we throw those data points out? Those are relevant questions to the business. And people will ask you that. My suggestion these days is don't bother. Just pick one metric and optimize heavily on it. If you're, say, optimizing on revenue, don't care about the tips, don't care about the discounts, don't care about whatever. Because if you're doing everything right, at least initially, when you optimize on one metric, everything that you want to track should always also go up at the same time. And if you want to fail fast, you don't want to spend time on digging into the nitty gritty of how we should define our business or incorporate the business logic into our metric. It's a waste of time. Most metrics should go up simultaneously as you optimize on your model. If not, then you're probably at that point where you can push your product out already. So that's my suggestion on how to pick a metric. Next question is, what kind of model should I pick? You know, there's an ocean of models when, when you uh, look at those online tutorials and just anything, right? Like, I can, let's, let's see, let's say, let's try how many I can name, right? Logistic regression, random forest, XYZ neural network, I don't know. <laughs> too many. There are too many. Too deep, too much. And I will always suggest that start small. I have been thinking about what start small means in the data science context or machine learning context, I would say find a data or a data set that you know is clean or a subset or a slice of a data set more to come that you think is clean and build a really simple model on it. Why? Because once you have a model, you have some outputs, you can start looking in, you can start discover some weird things about your data you can use that to verify that you didn't mess up your data pipeline. Don't, definitely don't do like a neural network that has one, 100 million parameters in your first run. Start with something really simple. It's fine to start with deep, deep learning. It's fine to start with neural network, but don't build a super deep network initially. Start with something really simple. Ideally, if you're doing classification, just try a little juice of regression. Make sure your data pipeline works. Make sure there's not something weird in your data. There's not a null, you know, some user just randomly. If your data is manually collected, those are a lot, there are a lot of problems in those data. Start small, and then you build on top of it. More to come. There's a little more than that, but I'll, I'll go, go deeper into it. And also try everything. I am always really impressed by kids because they're so curious. And kids love to try everything. You have those rubber ducky, right? They were just like, what is this? I don't like that. Put, put it away. What is that? Um, I don't like that. Put it away. And I think this is the perfect attitude in dealing with data problem because we don't know what works. What I think is a lot of the, if you look, if you read into the online tutorials or courses, you will find that most of them optimize on certain industry or certain categories of data sets. But I believe, it, at least in this room, you might have people who work in insurance, work with call centers, work in retail, work in finance. Those data sets are never published. And we don't know which model works. So the best strategy is stay nimble, stay simple, try as many as possible, as fast as possible, and then only go down the path that looks promising. That, at least that's what I have found is, um, I wish I had known. What I meant, you know, it, uh, as opposed to try everything, what would happen is when I first started, I would say, oh, let, let me try this random forest model. So I would pick this random forest model. I would do a lot of stuff with it, um, like run it, oh, okay, all the stuff. And now I would do a lot of uh, parameter search, try to optimize on this one model. Instead of 
you know, branch out to try different things. Total waste of time. Nothing ever comes out of optimizing a single model, at least in my experience of two years. Maybe your, your, if your experience is different, so I'm totally, I totally welcome you to challenge me and have a discussion because I would love to hear your experience. But to me, going deep has almost never uh, given me as much return as going wide. At least in the beginning. You want to go wide first before you go deep. I will uh, say a little more about why I come to those two conclusions. So I think what I just described was, or in the random forest model example, I was having a purest, what I call a purest view of methods. I think that in a perfect world, at least if it's an orderly world, you should have this blender. And let's say I go to Smoothie King, I'm like, Oh, give me a apple kiwi kale. So I throw that into the smoothie king uh, blender, and out comes a really nice cup of smoothie, and I just drink it. It tastes great. So ideally, that's what should happen, right? You throw data against one model, the data, uh, the model spits out your prediction, and the prediction works great. These days, I have a different view. I think making a good data uh, machine learning model, or um, at least a big completing a project, is more like making a dish, making a making food for your family. Let's say if I I don't know if that's how people actually make curry, but that's how I make curry. <laughs> <laughs> so correct me if I'm wrong. But I would start prepare by preparing my ingredients, you know, raw ingredients, and you know, some of it maybe I want to do a little stir fry. Some of it I want to throw into a bowl, uh, boil it before I combine them. You know, I, I prepare the sauce differently from the meat. So your data might have some part of it, which is the meat. There's some part of it, which is the sauce. Think of any data that we, we're in contact with. There are a bunch of features. They're usually categorized by something. Why? There, there's absolutely no reason for one model to fit into all those categories. And when you start small, let's say I want to only focus on, um, let me use sports. Let's say baseball. There's absolutely no, if, um, okay, uh, for people who are not watching baseball, you have nine positions in the game. So nine defensive positions. There's absolutely no reason to, for you to optimize all nine positions simultaneously. There's no reason for you or for me to not um, just dig, just categorizing, okay, you have outfielder, you have infielder. Can we just build two different models for those people and then we combine them? And most of the time, this approach is works. This approach works. It allows you to start small, allows you to fail fast. You will be able to see more weird stuff in your data. And the results is better. So just like um, I was thinking about the, if anyone went to Phil Anderson's talk today, you saw they built an ensemble model. And I think an ensemble model means you have a bunch of things, a bunch of models, you know, uh, knit together. And the reason, it's really, I, I would guess that they did not come up with that architecture in one run or, you know, when they first thought of that project. I would imagine that they probably tried a lot of things like that. And it, decided to put that model together that way and give you a very flavorful curry. So that's, a, that's my um, take is, I, if I were to tell myself from two years ago, stop trying to optimize on one model. Trying to make one model works for everything. If this slice of data works with deep learning, great. If, but if that slice of data can achieve what I wanted with logistic regression with the simplest model, that's fine. I can just combine them together and get what I wanted. One example is pizza. So I'm from Taiwan. We don't eat that much pizza here uh, in Taiwan. But I eat a lot of pizza here. I really like pizza. <laughs> Great. 
you know, these are great. However, if you come to Ohio, you will find that the pizza is a little different. <laughs> is that right? Any Ohio people can confirm that? So <laughs> that's my impression when I first drove through Ohio. I was like, what is this? This is illegal. <laughs> Turned out it was great. I love it. But there is no reason for you to not do weird things to your data. Feel free to be creative because you might just build something that nobody has ever thought of. When you start small, you are allowed to fail fast. And a lot of time, what determines how good your model is is not how good your blender is. You are not having a bunch of blenders, just a, a catalog of blenders from, ranging from $30 to $1,000. You know, the $1,000 absolutely give me the best thing ever, no. Most of the time, it's determined by your ingredients. So try different ways of slice and dice, try to do different things to your, to your data, and then feed them into different models and see what happens. And we can all build from there. By the way, this, is, this kind of pizza is great. You should try it. Um, what happens when you, you know, like, so another, another pitfall about um, data science or machine learning is even if you have, like, if you start uh, with a really big model with all the data feeding that big model, what happens usually is you will see garbage in, garbage out. That blender is fed with a ton of garbage and then give you a cup of smoothie. And the funny thing is, your business partner drinks it happily. <laughs> and your imposter syndrome or meter just like went way up. <laughs> what am I doing here? What did I do? And you want to avoid that. At least I would like to avoid that. I'm, I try to be an honest person, so if I try to avoid this type of situation, and I think we can all agree that this is not good for the business. Garbage in, garbage out. This turn has been set way too many times. I'll just conclude with one example. Because it can happen in places you don't expect. The example, again, I'm a baseball fan, is juice ball. Juice has a very negative connotation in baseball. Because it means putting steroids into your body to make you stronger. I didn't juice myself, by the way. Um, <laughs> what happens in Major League was, before 2016, if you have watched the film Moneyball, you will see that a lot of teams are putting their money into analytics and finding the best way to feel the balls. Where should I stand to catch all the balls? Because when you if a batter hits the ball and someone catches it immediately before it uh, go, uh, hit the ground, and then you get it out. That's like the ideal situation for the defenders. And if you go to a major league baseball these days, I believe if you go to Reds or Indians, you will probably see that too. You're going to see that um, all the outfielders will like feel their pocket before each batter. Look at uh, this piece of paper and then step three steps to the left, three steps to the right. What they're doing, they're using analytics to find where are the optimal configuration of their defense, um, or their defensive configuration. And a lot of time it works. So before 2016, you hit, it just goes straight into the glove. Last year, this happened. Every ball just all of a sudden uh, averaged three to four feet more you know, like every hit goes, goes out. A lot more home runs, 30% more home runs. What happened? Well, Major League juiced the ball. They juiced the ball. They, this year, they uh, published a uh, findings, which I think they know it. it they <laughs> <laughs> that they did something to the track of the ball. So a lot of balls went out of the park to get home runs, whereas 
that only happened last year. They didn't tell anybody. Nobody know. And a lot of people are suspicious. Pitchers are super suspicious. They were like, why all the balls are going out of the park in the spring training? We, they, but they don't have evidence. This type of thing can happen in the business world as well. Because everybody likes to change their business logic without telling you. If you have a really complex model, really complicated data pipeline, it's hard to diagnose this type of problem. You want to be, stay nimble and stay flexible so you can detect this type of problem early and fix it right away if it's possible. So that's, um, if I were to conclude um, this talk, I would say remember to start small, build a strong pipeline, and then iterate fast. Don't worry about the mathematics because the models, you can pick 100 models when you try everything. Only three of them seem to be promising. Then go ahead and study those three. Study the mathematics of three. Why, what makes them work? And then you can combine them better. So then you don't have to waste time studying all those 97. I think that's a better approach. And just, you know, so we can spend more time doing more interesting stuff without burning ourselves out. That's all. Questions in the hallway. Um, feel free to tweet me. If you took any picture, please tweet it. I would love it. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. You can find me on firstnamelastname.com. Just, I'll be here tomorrow as well. So just go ahead and just uh, say hi to me. I won't. I might bite. No, I won't bite. Uh, <laughs> so uh, just, just come say hi.